How's it going, ladies? Bruce is on Bobby Six Coming. Welcome to Sikamaya. It's finally time. I've pumped myself up. I've been putting this off because I know uh, how intense and how long and how complicated and everything this is going to be. But I know you guys have wanted this for a while. So it's finally time to get into Sikamaya. And uh, so I believe this is um, a work that's kind of derivative of Nakazawa's work. Not directly connected to him but I believe that was the inspiration uh, for the team behind this one specifically I'm not exactly sure on that but uh, the developer did send us over a copy so that we could so that we could play it and I even read the steaming streaming policy here and it was nice enough to say that it's they have no problem with a full full let's plays it's all good uh, we might get some occasional copyright claims uh, from licensed music and stuff but we deal with that every day anyway, it doesn't really matter. Uh, let's jump in, shall we? Finally! Let's do this. I hear it's very long, so buckle in, because this, <laughs> this is probably going to take me a couple of months to get through. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Let's start. I have my notes here. I understand that we need, um, we're going to need notes to cope. So I have a pen and paper as well, so if you see me looking down, I'm writing notes. December 15th, 2011. Oh, here we go. I've been mindlessly staring at the wall in front of me for a few minutes. When that finally registered, I slowly spun around. Oh, uh, that's not... Okay. The keys are a bit different to the usual visual novels. It mustn't be made in Reenpy. <laughs> I always thought I'd be quick at adapting to su sudden changes, but I'd recently realized how mistaken I'd been. Still unable to process everything, my brain kept struggling to accept that the previous few days had really happened. I wasn't familiar with the walls around me, but I'd always known of the place. Next to me was Shiroi Shiroya? White something? Less willing to acknowledge her surroundings. Keeping her gaze on the floor, she suddenly spoke for the first time since we entered. I think it'll be time soon. Yeah, probably less than 20 minutes. That was all I managed to master, even though I was still the same Atsuki I always, as always, I felt like I'd been rewritten into an entirely different entity in only a few days. I did try to, didn't try to say anything else. During the previous two weeks I'd grown accustomed to those brief interactions with Shiroya. After I spoke, the look lost in her eye, look, the lost look in her eyes returned. Sorry, I, this is not the day for it obviously, I can't read today. We had both agreed to come together, but it seemed like neither of us knew what we were doing. We kept awkwardly scanning the vast hall, moving forward tiny steps at a time and awaiting further instructions. Neither of us had any strength. I'd known Shiroya for a bit more than 15 years, and not once had she looked so empty. On top of everything, I hadn't been able to make her feel any better. Despite that, at almost 9 o'clock, we were inside Ashia Tower. The biggest building of Yushibana, the town where we'd always lived. It was situated on the outskirts, and we never entered it before. From the outside, the tower's contrast with its surroundings was immense. Beyond all the similar looking houses, its size made it visible anywhere in the town. It was that contrast which had caused it to be called a tower, but it was only as big as an urban building. The structure itself was more or less a cube, essentially as wide as it was tall but it seemed towering to people who had spent their whole lives in a rural area. It was a place Shiroya and I had always avoided because of the stigma associated with it. A large portion of the citizens were against its existence due to the people who owned it and its unnatural size. It wasn't very, I, was, I wasn't very familiar with the topic. Apparently decades in the past when the building hadn't been anywhere near as large, it had been the Ashia family's residence. It was known that they were a shady family, but they never suffered any consequences. At that time, they held a silent power over the town, and over the years, it gradually grew stronger. They became the image of Yushibana. Anyone visiting from the outside knew about that family before anything else in the town. Over the years, the old residence transformed into a focal point for business and tourism. I had never immersed myself in the matter, but that was common information that I couldn't even recall where I'd heard first. The place was some sort of museum, and behind it extended a mountain range that encircles Yushibana. 
It was known for housing numerous caves that held valuable gemstones, so enthusiasts tended to visit often. The Archia family had taken advantage of it and utilised their building as a gallery for the different gemstones that could be found in the nearby mountains. And when that happened, the part of the town in favour of the tower strengthened due to the increase of people who specialised in those gemstones. That was what caused the split in the population. The younger residents generally didn't mind Ashia, while the older maintained their private discontent. This is why we had never entered it, and on top of our more recent circumstances, I thought Shiroya might have been experiencing a feeling of betrayal for simply being there. While I couldn't say that I shared that strong of an emotion toward it, I wasn't very fond of the whole thing either. The reason why we were inside wasn't one that I could easily put into words. There had been constant publicity about the day's events for, the, for two weeks. According to Ashia, they were going to showcase a major discovery, one found in the very same mountains around town. But that wasn't something that particularly interested me, and I wasn't sure what to expect. The reason we'd come to the tower wasn't anything as simple as curiosity. It was December 15th. Outside, the environment was cold and coated with snow, and while the temperature inside was regulated, we'd been outside for so long that we still felt unpleasant. I glanced at Shiroya, who didn't return my look. Feeling slightly agitated, I turned a little. I could see a line of people who had come to th come, th had come thanks to Ashia's amb ambitious advertisements. Shiroya and I had been at the front of it for a long time. Next to us was a man I'd never seen before. He was tall and had dark hair, and like us, he seemed distant from everyone else. I hadn't seen him so much as look at me, so I hadn't given him a second thought. We were next to him because we would go to see the gemstone in groups of three. Since we'd been the initial three to show up, we formed the first group. The entrance fee had been expensive, but we paid it well in advance. From our perspective, it had been worth it. We remained by the door that would open at 9 o'clock, simply waiting for that to happen. At our left was another door that would open at the same time, and according to what we'd been told, both led to the main floor of the tower. On that particular day, not many people seemed to care about that, as everyone who could be seen as part of our line. For a moment, I wonder what the big deal was. Ishibana wasn't a large town, so the amount of people waiting behind us was fairly impressive. All that for a gemstone didn't seem quite right to me. But perhaps it made sense, given that it was Ashia's event. They cared about appearances, as anyone could attest. They were in many lines of business, but the most important one was looking good. Apart from the line, the only other people in the lobby were guards talking with a policeman, a woman behind the reception desk checking everyone's tickets, and a janitor who had been scrubbing the same part of the floor for a while. It was all unsettling and alien. The event itself was an abstract thing to me, and my view on the people who ran it was far from positive. All I could do was look at, the th at things and wait for it all to start. We had been asked to leave our phones outside for the duration of our stay, as nothing of the sort was permitted in the building. That meant that I had no way of looking at the time. There weren't any clocks on the walls, adding the fact that the person I was with was clearly uncomfortable and trying to hide it. The long wait had been much more tedious than we'd hoped. I continued looking at her, not knowing how to deal with the situation better. Finally, after minutes of looking down, she suddenly lifted her head, as if she just remembered that she was in a public environment. F following behind, she looked at me and seemed to try and to smile, but it was barely visible before vanishing again. I kept falling back into negative thoughts. No matter how I tried, I couldn't help that. I needed to be stronger and help lift Shiroya out of the pit she was in, but that was tricky seeing as I first had to get out of, out of the same one. So I just struggled against my feelings, wishing all the while that I could go back to how things had been before. Minutes later, a well-dressed man who had been standing near the entrance told us that if we weren't waiting for the event, if we were waiting for the event, we could go through the left door, sorry. Shortly after, a tall blonde woman wearing a suit entered through the one on the right. I could see her in a coat, er I'd seen her in a coat earlier. Before she disappeared through one of the doors, she looked over everyone present and began to explain what the procedure would be. Sorry for the wait, everyone. Well, now begin the group entrances. My name is Naomi, and I'll be chaperoning today's guided visit. As you likely already know, groups of three will move forward in turns. Each visit is estimated to take approximately 15 minutes. Once inside, I'll personally explain what we've prepared, and I'll also be available to answer questions within the specified time. Naomi's explanation was directed at everyone present. 
but it was hard to believe anyone further back could have heard her. She continued in a monotone voice. Keep in mind that phones and video cameras are strictly prohibited. I ask for all of you to please be patient and await your turn. When her scripted message was over, she relaxed her posture and directed her look at us. You three are the first group, correct? Seconds later, nobody had answered. The two people at my sides had barely paid attention to her, so I spoke before she would have to ask again. Yes. Alright then, please follow me to the event room. To be the first to see the second mayor. Second mayor. I don't know. I'd heard that word many times recently, but before I could think, she turned around and walked through the same door she'd entered from. I looked to my right, to check on Shiroya. Her demeanor hadn't changed, but she was aware of the situation. By the time I turned back, the man on my left had nearly reached the door. It seemed he was taking the initiative, despite his unenthused appearance. Rather, it was probably better to think of myself as lagging behind them, him being proactive. I followed, motioning to Shiroya as I did. She approached me, still wearing her heavy-looking coat. We found ourselves in a long hallway. We could see many doors lining each wall, some opened and connected by a decorative handrail. However, there were no traces of Naomi or the man. The floor seemed pointlessly wide. Up to the end of the hall, I could see a number of security cameras hanging from the ceiling. As we started walking, unclear about where to go, I found it appropriate to try and talk with Shiroya again. Are you feeling better? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. She continued walking, assuming that was the end of our exchange. I tried to press it a bit further. Do you regret coming? No, of course not. I'm seriously glad we're here. I mean it. I know how you feel, okay? It's the same for me. It doesn't help a lot to say it, but I don't want to see you sad. I'm here because I want to be. Atsuki, I'm okay. This is where I need to be right now. Sorry, I must look terrible. She wasn't being very convincing. You know, this isn't something you need to apologize for. Nothing about this is your fault. I'm not so sure. I wish I didn't have to be a drag for you now. Hey, come on. If you want to leave, we still can. Don't feel like you have to push yourself for my sake. It's alright. Thank you. Let's continue though. I was the one who wanted to come. Okay. We'd hoped coming to the exhibition would be for the better. Once it was settled that we wouldn't back out, I looked around shyly until a voice called for calling for us came from the middle of the hallway through an open door. You two, hurry up, the clock is ticking. Her unprofessional shout broke the silence and drew us forward. I saw her figure in a seemingly empty room. Through the open doors, there were cabinets covered by red cloths. Good. We're all finally here. Now we can start. Passive aggressive much. Once I went inside, I realized my initial impression had been wrong. The room would have been barren if it weren't for a single cabinet covered by a velvet curtain. The black-haired man was there, yet again, looking entirely aloof and fixing his eyes on the plain opposite wall. Alright. It would be helpful if you could tell me your names, since you know mine. While she said that, she closed the door we'd come through, and I took notice of the security camera in one of the corners, which was fitting for the place we were in. There was another closed door on the opposite wall, so we had 15 minutes ahead of us where we'd be shut inside. Naomi looked at me expectantly, probably because I'd been the one to speak earlier. Atsuki Hakatoki. Shiroya Mirana. Without being cajoled, Shiroya spoke her name. To my relief, she was looking directly at Naomi, and her posture was significantly less stiff than before. The black-haired man didn't respond immediately when we eyed him. And your name? Akaro. Akaro Asata. Perfect. Happy to meet the three of you. It was hard to read him. He looked passive, but he must have been interested in the exhibition. Naomi moved aside and placed herself before the velvet curtain. Then she took out a keyring from her pocket, and she got ready to begin the introduction. As you might already know, what's behind this curtain is not to be taken lightly, and being the first public viewers is a bigger privilege than you might think. What's being kept here is among the rarest pieces we've ever seen, and it's only been two weeks since the discovery. We estimate that the value of this cabinet's contents is immense. A proper appraisal has already occurred, but more estimates will come forth as everyone realizes just what we have in our hands. Part of the experience is the touch, so I'll open the glass and let you experience it yourselves. However, I must insist that you be gentle and keep your hands inside the cabinet at all times. We know and don't need this introduction, so let's move along. You've been praising this find of yours in every advertisement, so let's see how your claims hold up. Akaro's sudden input took us by surprise, but it made it clear that he did, did care about the event. My apologies. Let's start then. 
Now we put a small key into a lock on the left side of the cabinet and turned it. Admittedly, all the build-up was making me slightly curious, but for all I knew, we were talking about a, shi a slightly shiny rock. Nothing that would be ever interest me very much. Let's stop with the teasing. Here's what you've come to see. The named the Sekimiya. With one hand, she grabbed the bottom of the curtain and began to raise it. But even though my focus should have been on the cabinet, something else took priority. When I was least expecting it, smoke rose instead of the curtain, accompanied by a familiar, putrid smell that invaded the room. What, what is this? Without bothering to ask myself questions, I tried to find Shiroya. At my right, I saw her face morphing into shock. Atsuki, what? Her last word faded out quietly, and it was then when I realized my consciousness was getting cloudy. All of a sudden, all I could see was very dark smoke filling the field of my vision. I couldn't believe it was happening. Again. I couldn't believe it was happening again. Oh, okay. Naomi's hand had immediately released the curtain, and she was trying to steady herself while covering her nose. I couldn't find Akato until I looked down and saw that he had already fallen to the floor. The smoke filled up the entire room at once. In just a few seconds, my legs stopped responding, and all my efforts at getting my muscles to obey me were met with failure. At last, my entire body gave up, and I plummeted down. Thanks to the view I had from the floor, I could see Shiroya's outcome had not been any different. And from the falling noise I heard, the same could be said for Naomi. Behind Shiroya was the door we'd come through. The smoke had covered the ceiling, so everything was dark. Amidst the confusion, I was able to notice the lack of light under the door. Something which should have easily been noticeable from such a dark place. When I ultimately had accepted that there was nothing I could do to salvage the situation, I had a few seconds where I could only think about what was going on. Our room and its surroundings were fully silent. I couldn't hear a thing, despite what had happened, and I wasn't able to produce any noise. What the fuck just happened? I was able to realise how strange it was. Both doors had been closed, so I had no idea where the smoke had come from. Knowing the smoke was blotting out our awareness, I realised it had been done deliberately, and there were many reasons I could come up with as to why, going off what we'd just been told. As my remaining consciousness faded away, I could only hope I would quickly wake up to see Shiroi again. I wanted to pretend that I knew nothing would happen. But the images came back to me, seeing that hole in the floor. My heartbeat slowed and became inaudible. I knew that resisting was completely futile, so I closed my eyes, hoping to fast forward to be awake again. The thought of dying there was pathetic, but without a choice in the matter, I resigned myself to what was happening. Before all my senses faded, the silence was broken by a loud alarm, which had taken a while to be broadcast after the appearance of the smoke. Further in the background, I briefly perceived a much fainter and rougher sound that I couldn't identify. I lay on the floor of that smoky room with three other people completely powerless and clueless. Soon after the alarm played, the darkness became absolute and all my thoughts vanished. Chapter 1 Foot of the Mountain Interesting. I can think of a reason why that happened. Someone wanted to steal the stone. Obviously. But who? That's the question. An indeterminate amount of time had passed. I was a complete mess, and a constant pain pounded against the interior of my skull. Nothing had changed apart from the walls and ceiling which had been tainted by the smoke. As I confirmed that I was still in the event room, I tried to battle the intense headache mercilessly hammering me from the inside, focusing my vision in an attempt to spot Shiroya. There she was, still on the floor. She hadn't moved since I'd blacked out. I used up all the energy I could muster to try and rise, and after a few attempts I was able to sit up. While I, while I crawled to Shiroya, I, look, I looked behind me, as expected, Akuro's body still lay on the floor but he was far from my first priority. I reached Shiroya and turned her to face me. Her eyes were half open, and she seemed conscious, which was exactly what I needed to see. Uh, <coughs> my sentence was cut off by dry coughing that overtook my body. It seemed I'd inhaled a bit of the smoke, but it might have meant that we hadn't been unconscious for a long time. Yes, I think so. <laughs> her eyes opened fully, as she tried to steady herself with an arm. That smoke, what is it? Maybe li <coughs> Listen, we'll find out what happened. Just stay there a minute, okay? Do you feel okay? Yes. I could tell that she was barely keeping it together. She must have been afraid of the worst. 
just like I was. But that, but the, that time we'd woken up to safe, woken up safely. I looked around me. It was a bizarre sight, and the disgusting smell was still present after the smoke had faded. The room had been painted black. The curtains beautiful red. The walls, the ceiling, they'd all been corrupted by an ugly dark colour, almost purple. The floor, however, had not received the same treatment. It had become grey, but it was nowhere near the strong black that had consumed the ceiling. And there was something much more important that I quickly noticed. Naomi's gone, she's not here. What? Y you're right. Where could she have gone? The door's open. The door we'd gone through, not gone through, was very slightly ajar. Naomi could have woken up and left through it. Maybe to understand what had happened after seeing that we were all still knocked out. Even reaching that small conclusion took a lot out of me. But the headache was beginning to fade, almost as quickly as it had come on. I noticed our voices had awoken Akuno. We still hadn't moved at all. Ugh. What the fuck is this? He felt his face with his hands as he grimaced. Then he slowly stood up and attempted to balance himself while perplexedly looking around him. Hey, what's all this? You said Naomi's gone? What the fuck just happened? I think a lot of smoke suddenly appeared out of nowhere, right? Did it knock us out? For the first time he started the conversation with us. Before answering, it began to clean my face, as the smoke had created a sticky mask on it as well. I have no idea, but yes, that smoke must have done something and it had something in it that made us fall unconscious. And a few seconds before I fainted, a very loud alarm went off. An alarm? I must have fallen unconscious too fast. All I remember is getting very dizzy out of nowhere and falling over. I don't think I heard it either. Did it say anything? No, it was only a loud sound. While I was attempting to stand up, Akuto walked to the open door and looked through it. Oh, what the hell happened here? It's very dark, but the hallway's condition is the same. The walls and ceiling are black, and I can't see anyone. The whole hallway's covered. How much smoke was there? Everyone must have evacuated when they heard the alarm, even though it came a bit after the smoke appeared. Did you see where the smoke came from? I didn't see anything, and there's nothing here. No, but you're right, it surrounded us in an instant, and it probably appeared in, the, uh, in this room, and in the hallways at the same time. Both of the doors were closed, so the origin had to be here. Something must have happened while we were unconscious. Why are we alone, though? There were police officers outside, why haven't they come? We couldn't answer. Still a bit disoriented, I forced my neck to turn. The only thing in the room was the covered cabinet. However, I doubted the second mirror would still be there. The easiest conclusion to reach was that the smoke had been part of an attack designed to steal it. The smoke wasn't released in the other rooms, in the hallway. Everything was giving me a surreal vibe. I had no idea what was going on, but at first glance the danger seemed to have faded away. My headache was nearly gone, thankfully. That meant I could start thinking things through. What had happened? Why had it happened? How was I going to find the person responsible? Maybe I was just trying to distract myself from reality by thinking things like that? But I'd had a personal stake in it. I couldn't forgive whoever was responsible. Shiroya probably felt the same way. You couldn't just ignore it, and someone was missing. The room was empty. It had been empty before we'd fallen unconscious. Only the cabinet had been with us. But if the smoke had come out of it, it wouldn't have surrounded us so fast. We'd been stained, but not as much as the lower parts of our bodies. The ceiling was very dark, whereas the floor not so much. The smoke's density must have been low. Did that mean that the origin of the smoke had to be in the very centre of the room? How'd that make any sense? Shiroya staggered slightly. I reached out to try and hold her shoulder, but as my body was still recovering, both of us fell back to the floor. Without looking at us, Akuro walked to the door we'd entered through. It happened here too. Yeah, when I fell to the floor I noticed there was no light below that door. Given how dark the room had become, I thought the hallway must have been just as dark. The smoke was released at the same time even though both, both places looked empty. What the fuck is this about? The, that woman disappeared, but she fell unconscious too, didn't she? And you're right, why is there no one else here? Although those points were very strange, I was still relieved that none of us had been harmed. I lay on the floor for a bit, attempting to gather more strength. Calming to real- When thoughts had come to me, it was calming to realise that they were, were different from what had recently filled my head. This room connects two parallel hallways, which were attacked alongside this room all at once. Was this done to isolate us? Someone attacked the building to steal the second mirror, right? That must have been the intention. The smoke formed an easy path for whoever had planned it to make their way here, obtain the second mirror, and leave. It sounds like a messy and risky plan, but it's the obvious thing that comes to my mind. The open door seems to reinforce it, even though Naomi must have left through, it in through one anyway. Do I have to conclude that Naomi was part of this? And while we were out, she took the second mirror and, and left? 
putting this much suspicion at herself? Being a staff member? She'd know many things about the security system. And we were the first group to come, meaning out of the four, she was the only one that wasn't part of the first visits, visit coincidentally. Or I could say that if I knew Akira at all. I didn't think he looked distant from any any everything else. Maybe Akira was aware of the fact that the smoke would appear. He immediately faked his unconsciousness by throwing himself to the floor, knowing he would avoid breathing anything from the upper half of the room. The fact that the floor is barely stained proves the smoke never came down. Once we're all out of it, he obtains a second air. I should also consider that the smoke first arose shortly after Naomi unlocked the cabinet. This doesn't mean much, given she'd fall unconscious and leave the key available to be picked up. But if whoever did this didn't know much about the cabinet's mechanism, it makes sense that they waited until it was unlocked. But how did they know exactly when that was? Doesn't that mean that they must have been inside the room? Or again, doesn't that mean that only Arkado could have done it? Assuming this precise timing actually happened, how did he trigger the smoke? It could have simply been that he gave some sort of signal to someone else outside, but phones aren't allowed here. After we regained consciousness, he seemed to be perfectly fine physically. However, the mass difference between his body and our 19-year-old ones is very noticeable. It makes sense that the substance had a somewhat weaker effect on him. Though he passed out faster, don't forget that. Which means it actually had a stronger effect on him. Is Akado in possession of the second mirror right now? Or did he leave it somewhere? If so, why'd he come back? Only to not look suspicious? But that doesn't explain Naomi's disappearance. And how did the smoke appear? And why did the alarm sound late? And what kind of risky plan is this? I grimaced. I was getting carried away without realising how far I was going. In the first place, it was ridiculous to suspect anyone until I had information. But I knew, I could never let things remain as they were. Someone was responsible, and I wouldn't let them get away. I only had to bide my time. Before I could stand, I realised there was another avenue open to me. There was a security camera on the ceiling. Now someone was looking at the footage and the smoke came out of, the automated, of an automated system. This would make a lot more sense, however, it doesn't mean Akira couldn't simply have been the one who to wait for the automated smoke and then to follow whatever plan they had. This must have happened during the first visit for a reason. It means that whoever was looking at the direct footage would have been the one to activate the smoke system. I was doing it again, almost like a coping mechanism. I had to make sure Shiroya was really okay before anything else. When I attempted to lift my head, my body thankfully obeyed. I stared at the curtain that concealed the so-called Sekimiya. It was dark, and the substance that smoke was comprised of had dried up on it. Can you stand up? I think so. Supporting each other, Shiroya and I slowly steadied ourselves. Then I realised Akira had gone to the hallway. Finally, thank goodness! A shout came from the same area. It was a feminine voice, which at least indicated we weren't alone. We walked to it slowly as I wiped more of the solidified substance off myself. I was curious to see if the second Mia was still in the cabinet, but we would find out. Find that out very soon regardless. The hallway was almost as dark as the room. The smoke had coated every light bulb, but since there were many of them, some light could make it past the barrier. The smoke had created a thorough cover of the walls and ceiling, which must have been an intended result. It had set up a dark environment, but that couldn't be the sole purpose. Something had been added to the smoke to create the same effect on every surface it touched. Close to the start of the hallway, near the door Naomi had first appeared through, I saw human figures. Our approaching footsteps were noticed by one, and it rose from its knees. We got closer and saw two more people kneeling down. Akira was with them, and after finally arriving where they were, I noticed a small body on the floor. Isla's finally waking up. Thank God! That woman was the person we'd heard. She'd had, she had the little girl on her lap and was looking at her, uh, her closed eyes with concern. I see, so you three were also not able to evacuate. The person who had stood up was a well-dressed old man. As he said that, the two kneeling people turned their heads to face us. But the words, not able to evacuate, had sounded darker than I expected, especially due to his rough voice. Is she okay? I... I think so. She's finally breathing fine. Shiroya sat next to me next to the others and worriedly looked at the girl, who had been called Isla. Next to them was a guy my age who was staring at the girl in silence. Smoke appeared out of nowhere and knocked us out. Do you know what happened? I'm afraid I don't. You were in the event room, right? Shouldn't another woman be with you? Naomi, yes. She was gone when we woke up. Despite the dim light, I was able to discern his frown. I'm pretty sure she passed out too, but the door to the other hallway was open when we woke up. She left while you were still unconscious. That's strange. 
I inspected this floor for a bit and didn't find it. Is that strange? Maybe she exited the building entirely. When his look lowered again, I realized there was something very important that we were missing. Why was nobody else there? Why had the unconscious child not been taken outside, at the very least? She couldn't have left. If she fell unconscious like the rest of you, she still has to be here. What? The man didn't answer immediately, so I took the time to look him over. Due to the lighting, I'd just gotten the impression that he was a sim simple well-dressed old man, but those weren't casual clothes, he's a cop. Did all of you hear the alarm that played throughout the building? After I heard it, I saw all the smoke. Those words may be considered an important detail. Her shirt was white with a lot less sta and a lot less stain than ours, indicating that it hadn't been hit with the smoke during its release. In contrast, the woman and the other guy had the same smoke pattern we did. Being more stained on their top halves, the stature of the child had made her face the main target. I'm responsible for this building's security system. When the smoke appeared, I was in the security room, found in the other hallway. Since today was a special day, most of the visitors were in the lobby awaiting their turn for the event, so they had no problem leaving safely when they saw the smoke. You ought to know that this tower has many floors, but the only one o only this one is open to the public, and no one was on the higher levels. It was a big shock to see all that smoke, so I panicked and spent a while in the security room trying to figure out what had happened. When I realized I couldn't get anywhere, I exited and began searching through this floor. It seems you're all the f you all were the first two groups of three for today's event. Yes, we were told to wait here after the first group moved forward. Oh, that's right, I remember seeing her earlier, now that I look at her more closely. I also recalled seeing the three of them behind us in the lobby. I was still trying to understand the man's words though, as he had said the security room was in the other hallway. At the same time, we kept cleaning the smoke off our bodies until only a few traces remained. You said you saw the smoke, but your clothes are much cleaner than ours. Did it not hit you? That's right, I didn't leave the security room until it was in the hallway. When I said I saw the smoke, I was talking about the security cameras. Oh, I see. So he was the person I just accused in my head. I wasn't able to figure anything out through the cameras, unfortunately. When I left a few minutes later, I saw all the walls were black. I knew he was slowly giving me information, so I didn't want to interrupt him. However, more questions were coming to my mind, such as why he hadn't come across our group first. Wait, you saw what the hallway had looked like after you left the security room. Don't you have enough security cameras to see it from there? I couldn't help myself from asking for more details. The more I tried to coast through things, the more I resisted it. I needed to know as much as possible. No, the thing is, they became useless after the smoke appeared. It instantly covered the lenses of every camera that it was hit by. That makes sense. It must have been why the smoke created this film on every surface it touched. It worked to disable the cameras. Yes, while I was there, I had no way of knowing what was happening in the hallways or in the event room. I took my time to look at the footage of all the other rooms, but I didn't see anything suspicious at all. No people either. But I should get to what's most important. The alarm that played wasn't your usual emergency alarm. It was one that hadn't played before. I said that I stayed in the security room out of panic, but that's not all. Even if I'd left, it would have been pointless. One of the special functions of the alarm is to shut down all methods of escape. This means that we have no way to leave this building, and the people outside can't enter. Although I'd kind of been anticipating these words, it was still a heavy blow. Shiroya and I looked at each other. It seemed everything insisted on getting worse. Hang on, hang on, what the fuck? You're saying we're trapped here? How long, how long does it close the exit for? Why? And is there no way to undo or contact the outside? Obviously it closes the exterior, so that whoever the perpetrator is can't get away. It closes all the exit routes for 12 hours. The reason as to why is a bit complicated and for our purposes confidential. I'm sorry, but I can't get into that. As for a way to contact the outside, there should be one. We can try it. Shiroya wasn't fa faring well and Akuro seemed to be in complete disbelief at what he was hearing. Hey. It's gonna be fine, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. I turned back to the others. Barring Akuro, none of them seemed very surprised about the situation. Is this not a shock for you? I already told them. Getting Isla out of here would normally have been the first thing any of us would have done. It didn't seem like the type of building to have medical equipment stored in it, so the woman must have immediately tried to ex extract who I could only assume was her daughter. There was no reason to think some secret entrance existed, so I more or less had to assume that we were really trapped for half a day. The existence of such an alarm seemed absurd, but at first glance it might have succeeded at trapping whoever had been responsible for the smoke. So you're right, Naomi still has to be here. And is that it? I get that most people were in the lobby, but if someone else had entered the hallways, they could have evacu couldn't have evacuated either. 
Is it possible that the smoke in the hallway wasn't as dense, which gave people time to run for it before the alarm went off? No, that can't be. The guard remained quiet, finally spoke. We were right here when the smoke appeared. The moment we inhaled a bit of it, we were out like a light. We pretty much collapsed instantly. I see, then I couldn't tell you. From what I could see from there, the other rooms in the hallway were clean. If someone had been one, if someone had been in one, they had to have been trapped too. I could recall that the alarm had played approximately 20 seconds after the smoke's appearance, but it was unlikely that had been enough time for it to entirely dissipate. I can't believe what you're telling us. What the fuck does this mean? Why are we trapped here? I sincerely apologize. I'm confused as well, but there is nothing more I can tell you. We have to be here all day, but I'll try to figure out what happened. My name is Keite Kuiji. It was ridiculous, but we couldn't fight it. After a period of silence, we had nobody knew how to react. The woman spoke. She's Isla, my daughter. She's been unconscious since the smoke appeared, but her breathing's steady now. I'm er er Edna. I'm Shiroya. And my name's Atsuki. We came here together. How old is she? She'll be 10 in a bit more than a week. Her birthday's two days before Christmas. Realizing the rest of the group had introduced themselves, the guys, the guy followed. I'm Sai. We looked back at the band separated from us. Akaro. Immediately the silence returned. What the hell had happened? I thought back on the wordless alarm that had locked us in. It had lacked a message, seemingly only designed to tell us that we'd be trapped. It made sense if the culprit was one of us, but not even the staff member who was still there had any idea who could have, it could have been. It made things difficult. And the attack of the target of the attack it had to be second beer. There was no way it wasn't related. The very first showing of a newly discovered gemstone being interrupted had been only one thing. We hadn't checked whether the second mayor was still in the room, but it was confirmed that it was still in the building with us, even if it had been taken out of its cabinet. The attack had been deliberate. That was the most important point. Whoever was responsible, I wanted to find them and expose them. It was deeply personal. Alright, I think we should wrap this one up here because we're definitely out of time for today, but that was a good introduction. I see, I see. So we're already locked in. We've got the lock-in part down. We've been introduced to at least some of the group. I imagine there's going to be more, but we are locked in this facility now, as these games tend to go, which is good. We got the premise down. I like it. I like it. There's a lot of text. I'm not so used to the, the layout. It's more like, um, shit, what are they called? Sound novels or whatever? Uh, than your, than your usual visual novels, but I like it. I like it. I'm curious to see where it goes, and I can absolutely see the, uh, the Nakazawa inspiration there. Like, you can see a lot of parallels with um, the root double similarities there and that sort of thing. But that's good. That's a good thing because root double was very, very good. So, curious to see where this ends up. Uh, and if it is anything like root double, we're going to be here for a long time. What was that, like 60 episodes? Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I'll see you on the next one.